Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. I want to start by talking about Capital for a Day, which is something we started back in 2018 as a way to hear from everyday Vermonters in all 14 counties. The goal is to make sure we keep our finger on the pulse to what communities, employers, and families are facing. Because typically, we expect them to come to us, to call if they have an issue, or come to Montpelier to testify if they want to be heard. But the fact is, most people are just too busy for that. They've got jobs, kids to take care of, and other day-to-day -day responsibilities. And everyday Vermonters don't typically have lobbyists or paid advocates representing them in the State House or in front of agencies and departments. So I think it's important we make the effort to go to them. So on Capital for a Day, me, my team, the Cabinet, and their teams go into a county, visit, and listen to the people and places we serve. We answer questions, offer to help where we can, bring back ideas to improve in the areas where we're not meeting their needs. Last week, we were in Caledonia County, visiting rural communities who vo whose voices are far too underrepresented. So with the statewide press here today, I wanted to share more about what we saw and heard. Now, having just restarted this county tour, we thought it was important to start in communities that were hardest hit by flooding. As a reminder, we went to Washington County earlier in the month which included a flood recovery meeting in Plainfield. And last week, we met with town officials and residents in Lindenville to do the same. Both towns are struggling with capacity. With a small number of municipal officials and volunteers who have been dealing with flooding, infrastructure, paperwork, and budget constraints for over a year now, and they're tired. Importantly, Many of their challenges didn't start with flooding. These smaller communities are the ones I'm thinking of and fighting for when I talk about reversing our demographic trends, making Vermont more affordable, keeping employers here, and more. Even in a good year, without natural disasters, it can be difficult for them to stay ahead. But our visits didn't just focus on their challenges. We also got to see some of the sparks that contribute to revitalization. We started our day at the historic Inn at Birkeland in East Burke, which is just an incredible spot, next door to Mountain View Farm and Kingdom Trails. And thanks to the hard work and investment of Jim and Marcy Crone, it's now a beautifully restored inn, bringing tourists and revenue to the area. If you haven't been there, you should. It's truly a hidden gem and a testament to the opportunity and possibility when we leverage the assets we have as a state, from our history to our outdoor recreation, to grow the economy in rural communities. But it wasn't easy for Jim and Marcy, and right from the get-go, we heard a common theme. It's expensive to live and do business in Vermont. Affordability was also a theme at a man manufacturing roundtable held at Linden Institute and hosted by the Department of Labor. But these employers weren't focused on their own costs and the expense of doing business here. They were concerned about how unaffordable it was for their workers who live here. As I've said for years, we desperately need more workers as our population continues to age and there are fewer and fewer kids in our schools or young people staying to backfill the number of retirees we're seeing. With just a handful of employers in the room, I counted about 100 open jobs. And that was to keep up with the business they're currently doing. That didn't even account for all those they could use, but instead they're turning away business because they didn't have the workers. These employers are willing to train kids right out of school. They're working with our CTE centers. They're recruiting out of state, but it's not enough. When I asked what the top issue was, nearly all of them said affordability. 
The cost of living makes it hard to keep young people here, especially for entry-level positions. And by the way, they also noted they lose out on mil military retirees who are interested in starting another career in Vermont after they retire from the military, but won't, don't want to live in one of the only states in the nation that taxes their pensions. The second biggest issue, which is part of the affordability crisis, is a lack of housing. Even when they can recruit someone, they often lose that candidate because they can't find anywhere decent to live at a price they can afford. And then there's a concern for existing employees who make good money but spend far too much of it on housing, whether that's a $1,900 a month apartment or a mortgage or property taxes. To be absolutely clear on the message here, these employers who are essential to the livelihoods of hundreds of workers and the vitality of communities throughout the Northeast Kingdom are turning down business because of a lack of workers and are lo losing workers because of a lack of housing. And here's the thing. At a public safety event in St. Johnsbury a few hours later, law enforcement and health officials told us a similar story. Those with boots on the ground, facing increasing crime, seeing overdoses on the sidewalks of their community, named housing as a tool that could help. This is why I've been saying for years, housing is key. And it's why I was so disappointed when the legislature failed to meet the moment when it comes to housing and affordability this session. However, we did come away with some tools, but are only in place for two short years. So we need to act quickly to help address this housing crisis. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Curley. Thank you, Governor Scott. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the dire need for more housing across Vermont and what Vermonters and their local governments can do to increase the availability of affordable homes to buy and rent across Vermont. As you may have seen, last week, my agency released the latest Vermont Housing Needs Assessment. This is a document the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development requires of each state every five years. The Vermont Housing Finance Agency, or VHFA, was a tremendous partner in drafting this report. It highlights several aspects of our housing crunch, including data on those who are cost burdened and the amount of housing Vermont needs to get back to a healthy vacancy rate and housing market. Looking at demand, the new housing needs assessment finds half of Vermonters who rent spend 30% or more of their income on housing. Even more startling, one quarter of all Vermonters who rent spend more than 50% of their income on housing costs. Think of that. Half of every paycheck goes to housing, forcing renters to use the other half of that paycheck for food, health care, and life's other expenses. Clearly, that is unsustainable and a scary situation to be in for those renters and their families. When it comes to supply, the report shows that between 2025 and 2029, Vermont needs to add between 24,000 and 36,000 homes. That is 4,800 to 7,200 units per year. Right now, we build approximately 2,300 per year. That's not even half the target set in this housing needs assessment. Something must give. To get more units online as quickly as possible, during the last legislative session, the Scott administration advocated for near-term permitting exemptions, allowing some housing to be built without the need for an Act 250 permit to reduce the cost and the risk of building homes while simultaneously speeding up their construction. The legislature agreed to a two-year exemption period in certain designated areas. We wanted longer because two years when it comes to building is not a lot of time. 
and we wanted broader areas exempted because we need to maximize the potential of our buildable land. During this two-year period, communities will have the opportunity to work with regional planners to map long-term Act 250 exempted areas that will go into effect in 2027. We call on communities to participate in that process to ensure it creates broad, long-lasting opportunities for housing exemptions for, from Act 250. In a few moments, Commissioner Farrell will discuss in more depth the future tiered Act 250 system which will replace these interim Act 250 exemptions in 2027 and how that relates to the administration's effort to increase Vermont's housing stock. We have two years now to take advantage of this ex interim exemption window. So we all need to pay attention and work together to get more housing built. Property owners, home builders, community leaders seek out opportunities to build and rehabilitate homes. Vermonters are clamoring for more homes to rent and buy. They want and deserve that opportunity. Over the last two legislative sessions, there have been tremendous focus on land use and zoning to create an environment where more housing can be built. While the Scott administration does not believe we have done enough yet, there is an opportunity now before us to take advantage of what has been done to allow for more housing. This is the time to lead and create those units. I want to take a moment to highlight a tool that has been developed to support communities in navigating the mapped interim exemption areas that are in effect today. The Act 250 interim exemption map was unveiled last week. I encourage you to visit the Natural Resources Board website to see it for yourself at nrb.vermont.gov. It shows where housing can be built now without an Act 250 permit. This interim map is a valuable new tool. It's useful for towns and cities, builders, and for anyone who wants to put an apartment over their garage or build an accessory dwelling unit on their property. We are encouraging everyone to consult it and see what is possible right now when it comes to adding housing units. Please look at that map and figure out where, in your town or city, builders can quickly put up more housing. You want more kids in your local school? Consult the map to figure out where homes can go that will bring in young families. Have an employer in town desperate for employees but has a hard time finding them or keeping them because of a lack of housing? Use the map to see if your municipality can help ease workforce and housing shortages at the same time. Again, these interim exemptions expire in just 27 months. So while we continue to seek more tools to support home building, please consider this as a call to action to build more housing units now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Farrell. Okay. Thank you, Secretary Curley. Um, I do want to echo Secretary Curley's call to action to make sure that we're making the most of these exemptions while we have them. I'm going to discuss a few things today, including the long-term Act 250 tiered system that uh, Secretary Curley referred to. I'm going to give an update on the mobile home uh, task teams, uh, rapid placement efforts, and I'm going to discuss the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, VHIP. So picking up where Secretary Curley left off, I want to turn to the long-term tiered structure of Act 250 that was put in place in Act 181 this year. Um, this is going to set jurisdiction of Act 250 for decades to come. The long-term map of exempted areas is going to take place of what we currently have of the, the interim exempted areas. Um, this is going to be a pivotal moment in the future land use of Vermont. In Act 181, Vermont's 11 regional planning commissions were tasked with mapping cat and categorizing land in their regions. One category, tiers 1A and 1B, is going to remove many barriers to the permitting process for building housing. Whereas tiers 2 and 3, largely tier 3, but also in tier 2, there are going to be increased jurisdiction in one form or another. We're strongly encouraging municipalities, property owners, and all residents to engage in this process now at the beginning of the mapping process and to remain engaged throughout the process. <clears throat> Don't engage only at the end once the map is released because by then it may be too late. 
It could mean the difference between your property being exempted from Act 250 or being included where there's increased jurisdiction. We want to be clear. It's our hope that the Tier 1A and 1B areas are broader than the areas currently exempted in the interim exemptions. The interim exemptions currently leave out certain key areas that already have water and wastewater infrastructure, and it only creates transit corridor exemptions in Chittenden County. In most cases, it would be a very poor use of our land and poor use of taxpayer investment in water and sewer systems to not exempt areas where there's water and wastewater. We ought to be building in those areas. The long-term maps, which will be developed by the RPCs in partnership with municipalities, must include more area in tiers 1A and 1B than we currently have included in the interim exemptions. When it comes to this permanent mapping project, your participation is going to be invaluable. It's going to be vital that community members get involved in the process, and it's up to communities to work with their RPCs and all Vermonters to engage in this mapping to make sure that towns and cities can meet their housing goals. Turning to the mobile home units, uh, mobile home placement units task team, we're excited to share progress that's, um, that's happened since funding was allocated just a few weeks ago. So as a reminder, this is a coordinated effort across state agencies and with an outside housing partner to rapidly purchase mobile homes in bulk and to uh, use the state's bulk purchasing ability to bring down the per unit cost for home builders and uh, with the Agency of Transportation preparing the lots for placement in mobile home parks in partnership with these private park owners. Um, so I want to thank the Agency of Transportation for their efforts in leading this and their leadership in bringing this forward. And I want to thank our partners at the Vermont State Housing Authority for stepping forward as they have many times to help us administer this program. So since the funding was approved just a few weeks ago, the task team has conducted site visits to, to determine eligible lots in nine existing mobile home parks within the towns of St. Johnsbury, Coventry, Milton, Brattleboro, Braintree, Westminster, Springfield, and Bennington, securing 32 eligible lots. Uh, eight of the nine park agreements have been fully executed, with the ninth to be executed later this week. Bids have been sent out to contractors for lot improvements with an estimated completion date of November 1st, and bids have been sent out to uh, manufactured uh, home uh, to vendors with a, an estimated completion date of December 1st. Our housing partners are preparing the application process and beginning outreach to potential home buyers with the hopes that um, by the end of the year, we can have 30 new affordable energy star rated two and three bedroom units with many of the residents uh, moving in before the end of the year. Finally, I want to turn to an um, incredibly innovative, innovative and successful program, the Vermont Housing Improvement and Repair Program. Sorry, Vermont Housing Improvement Program, VHIP. Um, VHIP is an incredibly useful tool that was born out of the pandemic to create more units and to rehab units that have fallen uh, into disrepair. This program will provide property owners up to $50,000 per unit to create an accessory dwelling unit on your property to uh, split up your large four or five bedroom single family home into several apartments uh, or it could be used to bring a unit back uh, back online that has fallen into disrepair. This program has been used by hundreds of property owners across the state to create hundreds of affordable new homes for Vermonters and to create rental income for the property owners who have placed these units. During a recent trip to Caledonia County uh, for our Capital for a Day, as the governor mentioned, we were able to visit a building in downtown St. Johnsbury, right in the heart of downtown. Uh, the property owner had taken vacant commercial space um, on a main street in, in downtown St. Johnsbury, converted this vacant space into housing for residential units. Um, one of those new occupants of those units, um, they were gracious enough to let us tour the unit and bring us into their new home. Uh, and this couple had been successfully rehoused after spending four months in the local homeless shelter um, before transitioning into this. This couple was able to partner with um, the Agency of Human Services and this VHIP property owner to make sure that there is both rental assistance and an affordable home for them to move into. And now they have a stable living environment and are able to uh, seek and uh, maintain employment from downtown St. Johnsbury. This is a tremendous success 
um, and is an example of what's happening all over the state with VHIP. If folks want to learn more about VHIP, please uh, go to our website, visit accd.vermont.gov slash VHIP. And I'll now turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner Farrell. Uh, we'll now open up to questions. So the state in the past <clears throat> has talked about labor shortages and the rate you guys are saying we're building at now isn't quite where it needs to be. But if you were building at that ideal rate, do we have the workforce to be able to do that here in Vermont? Um, well, you know, it's, everything is, is focused on housing. So even those workers need housing. So the trades would be struggling to keep up, but, um, but we have to start somewhere. So we need to, to make sure that we're, we're getting back up to the uh, level that we need. Um, it's been estimated that we need about 6,800 units just to, to, to get back uh, on track, and then another two or 3,000 units, I believe, every year after that. So um, we, uh, we think there's an opportunity there, uh, if there's enough incentives for developers uh, to do this, and uh, with that, uh, might be able to bring in more workers to uh, to fill the gap and maybe uh, do something different than they're doing today, uh, which is focusing on more commercial entities um, and maybe focusing more on housing if it was just a little bit more lucrative. I apologize for my ignorance. The interim map that came out with the Tier 1A and 1B zones already identified is in place now. Correct. Well, sorry, the interim map is not the tier. I'm sorry. Thank you, Governor. Just to clarify, the interim maps do not show tier 1A and 1B. These are just interim exemption areas. So we won't have the tiers in place until 2027. Got it. And so the interim map um, that you're hoping looks very different when those tier 1 and 1A and 1B exemptions do become formalized. Um, it'll be two years before those get put in place. And you're hoping that the building community, municipalities engage over that two-year process to make sure that that permanent map uh, includes the sort of areas already served by water and sewer that you were referencing. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I want folks looking at the areas that are currently exempted because we fought hard to make sure that we had exemptions now. So we want folks building now, but as the permanent maps are drawn, it's really important that folks participate so that all of those areas that aren't included now are included in the long term. Um, Vermont Housing Finance Agency issued a report last September that found that it cost about $500,000 to build a modest apartment or small home. Um, if you're looking to create workforce housing, how do you square that circle? Well, a lot of what we're trying to achieve is uh, areas where you can build in greater density so that the per unit cost can come down. Because some of the fixed costs, such as land acquisition and bringing in infrastructure, you want to spread that over more units so that per unit cost can come down. You've seen that a lot with multifamily construction, and oftentimes when there's one multifamily building built, that brings infrastructure into a site, so then it's going to be more affordable to build the later units in the next phases. We're seeing that in Middlebury with Stonecrop Meadows. But uh, in addition to that, we're trying to seek incentives such as um, one thing that we've pitched, property tax incentives, um, so that folks can have additional cash flow support at the start of the project. I think there's more work we need to do as a state to look into infrastructure support to, for those front end costs. But uh, in the meantime, what we need to do is continue to let people build densely so they can spread those per unit costs. Did you want to add anything, Governor? Um, I guess I'm just talking to developers out there who are telling me uh, the promise of the starter home of the past is it's gone, it's evaporated, it doesn't exist anymore. I mean, you can't build a new unit at a cost that a working Vermonter is going to be able to afford. I'm just wondering how you address that bigger picture problem of residential affordability. Well, there's a couple of things. One was the VIA program uh, that uh, Alex had mentioned. I think that that's viable. We've seen the success of that. I think we should be taking advantage of that. And those who are living in large homes uh, that could add on an accessory uh, dwelling um, would be, it, it would be uh, helpful to them to pay the property taxes, for instance. Um, and uh, make it more viable uh, as well. Um, 
it's really, you know, it comes down to a basic economic principle, uh, supply and demand. Right now, we have much more demand than we have supply. Uh, so we need uh, to ramp that up. That will bring some of the costs down, not to the levels we need. Uh, but uh, but we also have the, the mobile home, manufactured home program that we talked about. Putting these units uh, in uh, existing uh, um, parks that have empty lots, improving those lots and uh, putting unit, u new units in there um, so that people can buy them as well at a much reduced cost. We are buying uh, some of these units at less than $100,000. So when you compare that program um, and, and I would count that as being starter homes for the working class, uh, two to three bedroom energy efficient homes, units, um, for they can buy them for less than $100,000. We're, we're hitting the mark there and we might have to ramp that up a bit. So we need all classifications of housing, not just manufactured homes, not just accessory dwellings, not just condos, not just duplexes. We need all of the above. And I think that there's opportunity. If we can provide tax incentives uh, for uh, developers, then I think that that will make it a little bit easier for them to get into the market and start producing uh, some of the homes we need. Anything else either of you want to add to that? I, I'd just say that you're right. There's a lot that we're not going to be able to do to bring down construction costs. and. Um, we are seeing where some developers are able to find um, efficiencies and, and get that cost lower, but what you're pointing out is certainly an economic reality that you can't build a two-bed, one-bath for $200,000 anymore, but uh, within that, I think we can certainly still find ways to acknowledge while there are economic realities outside of the state's control, we certainly can create an environment in which more affordable homes can be built. All right, I wanted to follow up. I mean. In speaking with some Democratic lawmakers, they see that this Act 250 bill really did hit the mark in terms of incentivizing building where we want it, like in our downtown centers, and more importantly, out of the floodplain. So maybe can you just speak a little bit more about why why you think it, it falls short or why it doesn't go far enough? Because it's been so select. Um, it's, it's a very small area when you look at uh, what we're really doing um, and some of the areas that are going to get these exemptions. Uh, it doesn't do enough. It doesn't do anywhere near enough to counter this crisis that we're facing. So we needed to, to take emergency measures, real emergency measures with this crisis that we didn't take. And uh, this conservation bill that was passed uh, just does far too little uh, to help with the housing crisis that we face. I, uh, you know, when you, again, when you look at some of the areas um, that were given some exemptions, there were three counties that were left out, really. And I was surprised to see some of the legislators who voted uh, to override the veto um, that were hurting their own, their own counties. That was Bennington, um, um, Grand Isle, and Essex, I believe. So it was just counterintuitive. We could have done much more to help a broader cross-section of people. What more would you like to see done? I mean, All we, we had the, the Homes Act two, two years ago. Yeah. We had this Act 250 bill. Are you going to be coming forward with another housing package or sure, more recommendations? Sure. I mean, we're going to keep pushing for a broader um, broader bill. I mean, we, we're just nibbling around the edges here when we're faced with a crisis. As I've said before, many people in the last election talked about the housing crisis. They said this is an emergency. This is this we've got to do something now. And I don't you know, they just failed to meet the moment. It wasn't enough. Is there a universe where I know that the wealth tax was one thing that was floated this year to help fund affordable housing? Um, you of course didn't like that idea. Is there a universe in which that you'd maybe accept a new tax to put towards housing in exchange for what you're asking for? Again, I examples. think there's, there's a lot we can do with regulatory relief that we haven't done. So let's take that step first. Anything else? I just, if, if I could just add, try to like personalize what's happening in the very rural parts of our state when we talk about, you know, the governor saying like, 
the the exemptions are really pointing to you know the Chittenden and the Franklin County areas. And as I travel around the state and I hear employers talk about it from their ability to achieve their economic growth objectives, as well as families who are saying our little schools are closing because nobody's moving here. Well, why why aren't they moving here? Well, people are aging in place. They're staying in their homes longer. So the homes aren't freeing up. There's no new construction. There's no place for these new little families to move into their, their regions, their locations. So if we're scratching our heads saying, why aren't our schools filling up, right? It's because there's no units coming online and there aren't people that are moving to the next place and beyond, right? So I think that's why, you know, I know I feel so passionately about making sure that we can put housing in all parts of the state not just in these really you know, condensed uh, parts of Vermont, but you know, our healthy um, rental market should be around 5%, and we're at 3% and under everywhere in the state. So um, you know, just to sort of put a fine point on all of it is, it's not enough. We need to do more um, everywhere in the state. Separate note, um, in Burlington, the, the mayor uh, is, is calling for um, the charter chain banning guns in bars. Senator Phil Baruch has also said that he would make sure that happens in the Senate. If, if that bill were to land on your desk, is that something you'd yeah, support? That much, much too early for that. Um, it's something that I have opposed in the past if, uh, if a bar wants to, to, uh, to ban them um, from their premises, they can. Um, so, I, I don't think that's going to solve the problem. I think that we have, there's, a, there's an erosion of, of uh, society uh, that's led to this. It's not inside the bars. Uh, the shooting we saw last week was actually outside the bar. I don't know if they had the weapon inside or not, but that's not where, that's not where it happened. So, I think that's, again, that's, that's not the problem. We need, we need accountability. We need to hold people accountable for what they've done, um, and these repeat offenders that uh, that are just walking free after allegedly committing a crime multiple, multiple times needs to end. You mentioned a few weeks ago uh, that oh, some of this has been also tied, just the general uptick in violence has been tied to drug trafficking, especially with young people, maybe from, from out of state. Have you been thinking, we've, we've had Raise the Age has been paused for a few years now. How have you generally been thinking about how that law has been working and, and whether the state should continue down that path? Well, again, I, I think that we should be careful what we do. Um, we've seen uh, the negative effects of raising the age, so to speak. Uh, they're using these young folks that are, some would have considered of age, uh, to, to become human mules for the drugs, knowing there's no accountability. They're, they're going to get, they're, they're not going to be held accountable. They're not going to be adjudicated in, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the courts, um, just uh, as a juvenile. And so they get away scot-free. So we need to make sure um, that we know what we're doing when we move forward with this. I'm all in favor of, of people getting a second chance, a third chance, uh, maybe even a fourth chance. But um, this is going on, and they're taking advantage of our youth. They're taking advantage of Vermont. There's a reason they come here, and it's because of that. What can be done? Don't, don't raise the, don't raise the age. You know, hold, hold, hold people accountable for these, uh, these trafficking uh, of drugs. I mean, it's, we, we've had, you know, we've made some gains, uh, admittedly, uh, especially in the last year uh, with the Senator Sears, uh, but we need more. Um, again, we can't let people get away. We need to. Public safety is a high priority for any government, and uh, we just need to hold people more accountable so they know when, when they take action, there's going to be, um, there's going to be a result uh, from that. 
the accountability meaning setting, sending them to jail? Possibly. And so, you know, people say, well, 90K ahead, right? Yeah. So. That happens, for, that happens for a while, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's got to be a deterrent. I mean, if they, if they know that there's nothing they're going to be held accountable for, they might go through juvenile court, and that's it, and let, let go. What's the incentive? What's the deterrent there? So increased costs on corrections would be a, a, a worthwhile trade-off for you? Well, it depends. Again, it depends. We have, to, we have to see how it works. But right now, we know, we're hearing from other states, they're, they're, sending, they're sending kids into Vermont because they're not going to be held accountable. So that's not working. So I would ask, what will? Um, you mentioned capacity issues that you're hearing about when you go to counties like Hardwick, like Orleans, um, and a lot of folks in the flood recovery universe are also citing those capacity issues in those small rural communities. You were mucking out houses, I believe, in Orleans County last week. Caledonia. In Caledonia. Um, so, I mean, do you think this state needs to do something to ramp up resources that are available to long-term recovery or other groups that are engaged in this work on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, and, and we have, I don't know if Doug is on the line, but uh, we have taken steps in that way and we need to, to focus on doing more. Again, having one uh, a year ago, uh, one flood a year ago, and then being hit again has really uh, put uh, a lot on the local officials, these small communities that can't do it, but we have long-term recovery groups. Doug, can you talk more about that? Yes, absolutely, Governor. Uh, so Doug Farm, Chief Recovery Officer, uh, Yes, the long-term recovery groups, the governor is correct. Those are the best way to connect and stay connected with individuals. The Vermont Community Foundation has been doing a lot to support those long-term recovery groups. They are volunteers, but they do get some financial support from Vermont Community Foundation, and they work on a common technology platform. Uh, we have redeployed some uh, state employees. They're actually in training today through Friday um, for disaster case management so that they can go out. Uh, we have nine employees that we're reallocating to, to help in the short term to provide those long-term recovery groups with more resources, more ability to interface with people, help them solve their issues, uh, and work with, of course, work to help them, help people in the households work with the FEMA process as that starts up for the seven counties that got individual assistance. And then we are evaluating what we're going to do in the medium term. Um, but for the next several months, we'll have those uh, bridge case managers from the state working directly with the long-term recovery groups, um, connecting with them. Uh, and uh, we assigned three of those people to work with Curve in the Northeast Kingdom uh, because of the, the large number of communities hit in the Northeast Kingdom. And, um, you know, that is a volunteer group and they, they've been doing their best to cover a very large region and they've been doing great, but they, you know, they, they really needed assistance. So we are assigning staff to help them. You said, Doug, you're still evaluating what the medium term might look like. Um, are there other sorts of resource deployment strategies that you're considering right now that you can talk about that, that those groups may see in the future? So we got a disaster case management grant from FEMA after last year. Uh, I think we've learned a lot about how that grant could fit into our strategies. Um, so. A disaster case management grant from FEMA, we may apply for one this year as well, but um, it would be part of a broader strategy and not necessarily the main interface for, for supporting households. Uh, because many households, they either don't make it all the way through the FEMA process or for whatever reason, they're not comfortable engaging with FEMA. We still want to be able to help those people. And the FEMA grants are exclusively designed to work with people who have uh, gone through the whole FEMA process and are continuing to engage with FEMA. So uh, I, I do believe we'll be, we'll be looking at the FEMA Disaster Case Management Grant as part of it. Um, and then, of course, how we, however we can work through that existing long-term recovery group structure, work with the Vermont Community Foundation, who is continuing to support those efforts and whose donations to, to that fund are extremely important because they are helping bolster the whole system. Um, 
And then the last thing I would say is we have a new long-term recovery group forming in the uh, Richmond, Huntington area. Uh, because that area was hit harder this time around than last year. So we are seeing, we are standing up and helping to stand up a new long-term recovery group in that area so that individuals and households in that area have a group, a local group to connect with and, and a voice to represent and, and uh, to speak to us and to let us know when their region still needs help. I did also want to mention the, uh, the volunteer uh, recovery group in the Northeast Kingdom. They're located in, in um, Linden. Um, probably one of the most organized groups that I've ever seen. Uh, they had everything ready for us. Uh, they had uh, boxes uh, with, with all the PPE, all the tools you could possibly need, checklists, they even provided lunch and water. Uh, they were just, it was amazing, amazing what they've accomplished and, and how good they've gotten at it, which again, they acknowledge and wish they weren't so good. Um, because it meant uh, that they had to um, face uh, many challenges to get get to where they are today. But again, they're tired. Um, it's uh, it's overwhelming for some of them, but they're you know keeping their heads up and moving forward. So they deserve a lot of credit for what they've done. I don't believe the OTRGs are written into the state's emergency response plan as it exists right now. Is that something you think ought to change? I don't know, Eric uh, or Doug. Uh, what what do you think? Governor, we are definitely in the process of looking at how the individual recovery is captured in the state emergency management plan. I think whether or not long-term recovery groups are written into the emergency response plan, that's a different question, right? We had a unique scenario this time around where long-term recovery groups were functioning when a massive statewide disaster hit, right? And that hasn't happened to us in the past. So we should have protocol for when that happens, but we shouldn't normally plan for a long-term recovery group to be in place, because generally speaking, they're gonna take, they're gonna be active for three to five years, uh, hopefully not five years, sorry. Uh, generally speaking, it's somewhere around three years, but, um, and hopefully you don't get hit by two major disasters. But yes, we should have a way to make sure we're communicating well and sharing information appropriately. Long volunteer groups, long-term recovery groups are volunteers, and we also want to make sure we respect the democratic aspects of the municipalities and the emergency management directors and the town governments and, and work with them appropriately. So I think that's something we're evaluating whether that should be worked into the plan. But we definitely want to make sure going forward, if we do have any more events, we, we don't have any confusion. We want to make sure we have good communication. Governor, um, it's a beautiful day out. It's going to be a Pretty, pretty gorgeous night, it's still warm out. There's been a number of events in the Chittenden County area, at least, that have been canceled because of um, Tripoli. Um, what's your read on the situation with it? How Vermonters should be navigating? Like, how should people be feeling right now about this? Well, again, um, the, with the cooler temperatures, uh, we have I've had a frost, I think, maybe came close to having a frost up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, the night before last, that's good news in some respects uh, because uh, that uh, is a deterrent to the mosquitoes carrying the virus. Um, so the, the further we go into the fall, the better off we're going to be. Uh, they should just take the advice uh, of the health department and make their own decisions. Obviously, this, uh, this disease is, is a dangerous disease, uh, but it's not widespread at this point. So again, we should we should acknowledge that it's there, uh, take precautions, uh, you know, make sure you, you put on a bug repellent uh, as well as uh, keep your sleeves down uh, when you're out working or in that atmosphere. But, uh, but at this point in time, we're, uh, we're just managing, uh, making sure that people are aware that it's, it's here and what they should do to protect themselves. Is there somebody from the Department of Health on? Um, we have uh, Jenny is on right. from uh, HS. I won't bother Jenny with it. Let's see. All right, we'll go to the phones. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, one point of clarification would be appreciated when it comes to this two year exemption period uh, under Act 250. If someone, if a developer gets their permit in within the window of those two years, 
Are they still able to build versus the two year if you haven't finished construction or, or is there, what's the cutoff in terms of what a developer actually can uh, get a project done still? I believe uh, that uh, once you obtain the permit that you can continue to build even your, uh, out of the two-year period. I'm getting a head nod. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and then the other question is, um, when it comes to the conversations came up a lot about construction and construction costs, but Secretary Curley pointed out fairly that Tremendous number of homes that seniors are living in and they're not leaving because they, even if they sell it, they have no place to go. Uh, and the demand on senior living independent complexes is immense throughout the state. Um, is there any advocacy going on for funding for developers to do those that isn't tied to too high a percentage of affordable units in those? That could be, because that could loosen up a lot of inventory in a more rapid fashion. Yeah, when I talked about um, more housing throughout the, the spectrum, uh, that includes uh, long-term care facilities, so to speak, uh, senior, more senior housing, uh, because as you, as you correctly noted, there's a lot of seniors uh, that uh, uh, retirees that have uh, their kids have moved on, and they are now living in a in a house that's too big. Uh, for uh, them or their means, but they have no place else to go. Uh, so we need, again, more housing throughout, senior housing included in that as well. Uh, no other questions. Thanks very much. Back to the room. Could we go back to raise the age? The, so are you saying that you think the second part of implementing raise the age, that it should not ever happen because it's been put off several years? But do you think it should happen? I think we should reflect on that. Um, you know, we've advocated uh, for uh, this pause, and uh, I think we should just learn from it. I'm going to ask Jay. Uh, Jay was uh, our, our um, Jay Johnson from our staff, our attorney, had worked uh, with uh, the legislature on this, and uh, maybe she could. Uh, add some some flavor to this uh, sure thanks governor um so raise the, age, raise the age is something that was implemented back pre-covid um it was it was passed pre-covid it the first stage was 18 year olds went into effect where they were automatically in the family course um at the age of 18 up to 19 uh during covid and so we have had some experience with 18 year olds. As the governor discussed before, uh, we are seeing that we're having issues with um, accountability and increased use of juveniles basically for um, illicit drug trafficking purposes. 19 year olds we know um, are, we're having similar issues, very often involved in violent crimes with tragic ends. Um, so, it really depends on how you implement Raise the Age and whether you have the services and the systems in place to be able to handle the population that you're talking about. So we often hear the phrase brain um, development or the brain science, right? And that's sort of the explanation that people are expected to just take at face value. But there's two pieces of that, right? The developing, the brain develops until 25. But at the same time, you need a system that swiftly connects individuals with the consequences of their crimes, the impacts on the victims. And we do not have that system in place. Our courts can't do it. Our DCF services providers are under tremendous stress with this more, with this older, more violent population. So you really have to do, you have to, look at theory, which is being supported by Columbia University, um, and you have to look at what's happening on the ground, and we do have unintended consequences on the ground. So just running headlong into raise the age based on the brain science um, is something, like the governor said, we really need to be thinking more carefully about and how we do it, what's working and what's not working. I don't know that we've had that conversation. Do you think that first piece of implementation of Raise the Age, the 18-year-olds up till their 19th birthday, 
should that be rescinded? Should we go back on that? I think we we can we could leave that in place, mm -hmm. um, but I think that uh, again, I, going any further, I think would be a mistake. Okay. That's my my personal opinion. Thank you all.